And then the reason why I'm doing it is like uh, I always say like uh, we not try to be fit in that uh, uh, religious belief system, not that reason. We not try to because I it's my duty. That's not reason. Simply, I uh, what I uh, went through the difficulties in the past, what I'm going through difficulty right now, what will face a difficulty in the future. None of us want that kind of go again. So only way to avoid that one is like uh, we have to eradicate the causes and conditions. Yeah? If you eradicate the causes and conditions, we're never going to face in the future. So the best way to eradicate these causes is the Dharma. Yeah? So in that point of view, then it really helps you how important is the Dharma. And that, when you realize that, you not think I'm a Buddhist practitioner, that's what I have to do. No, that reason is not the right reason. Because I have a duty or commitment, that's not a good reason. Simple the real reason is like, I don't want to be suffer. I want to be perfectly happy, you know. So that's the greatest reason to practice Dharma. Yeah, that's so, so if you know that, then and that understanding, then you're not going to have attachment to this life. Until that, it's very hard to get rid of, because the attachment for this life is like a habit of many lives. Like a, I mentioned right at the beginning, two ways you think. One is like a, uh, simply say, I don't want to attach, it's not that easy because you don't have a control to your mind. Because the, your mind is controlled by the delusions. So you need to defeat this delusion to recapture this mind. You know? So that's one reason. Uh, second is like I said, like this life is like a, a mirage. No matter how much you expect you're going to quench your thirst, never going to be quench your thirst. Yeah? So rather we look for the mirage going to curse, we should look for the real water to quench our thirst. Yeah, that's one. And then you look back and since we born until now, what we really achieved. Not that much. But I it's not right to think I oh I wasted my time. You know. Don't be feel negative. A negative also not going to help you. Just simply say, in the past, uh, due to my delusion mind, or due to my lack of karma or meritorious jit, I haven't found the Dharma. And then now I found the Dharma, so uh, I'm not going to waste the rest of my life. So just simply correcting it rather than feel bad about it. Because when you feel bad, it brings negative. Negative is not going to help you practice Dharma. It makes you more unpleasant. So that's not the right method. Just simply say, now it's a great me to have this opportunity to correct it. Rather than so much live in the past and regret about it or guilt about it. It's not going to help you. Because the more you stay in regret and guilt itself, it's negative. That negative makes you feel bad yourself. When you feel bad, very hard to motivate to practice them. So just simply this opportunity to correct. Yeah. And now second, like uh, if you attachment to samsara, you do not have a renunciation mind. <coughs> so uh, wherever we take birth in the samsara, the full of uh, suffering that we went through, all the realms of sufferings. Uh, in order to uh, free this suffering, one needs to have a genuine sense of renunciation. The biggest obstacle not to uh, develop this renunciation mind is like a attachment to samsara. Still things like a samsara is a wonderful. I'm not talking about the place is wonderful. You know, I'm talking our delusion mind says this is wonderful, then we want more. You know? When we not get what we want, we get ang anger. Or someone got better than you, you get jealous. Or you got better, much better than others, you get ego. So all these things, if you think just wonderful out there, that concept brings this jealous, uh, attachment, anger, everything out of it. So these are the the main obstacle to renunciation. Yeah? So therefore, one need to really know my delusion is not telling me the truth. Delusion mind is deceiving me. So now I must divorce. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Funny. Yeah. 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 So in this we call the divorce, your delusion mind is a non such mind. Yeah? So now just imagine uh, the delusion your partner live with you and always bashing you, always like uh, giving you a headache, always make you miserable. Still you think it's a, yeah. Still you think it's a wonderful. But then just uh, <laughs> So, so in this way, it's good to really kind of dharma is like to give you some idea. The real clarity comes to use your own experience. If you use the dharma, it's, your dharma is like a magnified glass, and use this and then look at your own life. You can see very clearly how did you go, how it's going right now, how will go. So that way, then the delusion is nothing there to, to attach, actually, really think, you know. So that's where I developed the renunciation mind. And then third, like I said, what is most beneficial to myself, what is most useful to help others, is the Buddhahood. Once you attain, attain Buddhahood, you completed your wishes, now you have a power to fulfill others' wishes. So what is the main obstacle to attain that Buddhahood is to grasp yourself. Yeah? So if one sincerely wishes to attain Buddhahood, one should eradicate the grasping self. Yeah? So in order to, to, get, uh, uh, to get rid of the grasping self, it's not easy. So we use a skillful method such as the practice of loving kindness, compassion, Bodhicitta, more you train, more you get used to this uh, practice, naturally this very grasping self transforms into the cherishing to others. Yeah? That's how it works. So in this way, like uh, when we do Bodhicitta, like, uh, such as equalization Bodhicitta, and then uh, exchanging uh, Bodhicitta, I mentioned like exchanging is like, uh, we can do only little things. We cannot do big things, we not achieve that. So just keep training about this exchanging meditation. One day we reach it, such as a, a enlightened state or first bumi, then we are pretty much ready to actually exchange. You give your pleasure to someone. Someone's really suffering can take on you, such as the, uh, when Buddha, uh, before he was fully enlightened, like he was like a uh, bodhisattva, uh, born in the one of the royal family, and he was the youngest son. He, his name was like a great compassionate. And then these three brothers visit in the forest, and then saw one mother tiger, almost uh, dying uh, due to the starving. And that time, uh, uh, this uh, three son or prince of the royal family saw so this uh, mother tiger almost dying because of the hunger, and then this younger son asked the two other older one, what is the best way to rescue this mother tiger? Because if you don't do anything, she might kill all her five cubs. Then this younger son, he got great compassion to this mother tiger, and asked to her other brother what is the best way to uh, save this mother tiger. Then other two brothers says if she gets uh, some kind of fresh blood and flesh, then there's a possibility she can recover. So the moment he heard, he decided he was going to offer this his own body to the mother tiger. But the front of the two brothers, they're not going to stop him. So they're pretending to return to the palace. Halfway, the young, the youngest one said, I need to go back, you to go hide at the uh, palace, I will follow you. So he returned to the mother tiger, and then he so compassionate a lie in front of the mother tiger, because she is so weak, even she can't, can't bite or anything. Then he just take his cloth off, put in the, the tree branch, and then break one branch of the tree, cut his own body, let leak the mother tiger. 
Then slowly she gets strength, and then she add his body. So the ordinary person is um, is not right, is not because he was enlightened already, already in the Bhumi state. So he don't have a pen or what we have a pen, because he realize the absolute truth. So only at that time, we are allowed to actually sacrifice our body to someone need, because death is not only just a uh, uh, accidentally. Uh, just offer his precious body to the mother tiger. Actually, there's a few because uh, she has a great potential. What the potential was is like uh, in the future when Buddha uh, attain enlightenment, these five calves become his uh, first five disciples. That's he taught noble uh, for noble truth. This mother tiger is the first nun. You know, when Buddha was full enlightenment, so he sees great potential. That's the reason he sacrificed body, not just because normal ordinary tiger who die and just be this precious body. So that's the reason. Okay, when you offer something precious, you must know the benefit, pur- purpose of you giving is a sacrifice the precious things, not just to give precious some ordinary reasons. You no, know? so one hand. It's very precious to give this body to someone. On the other hand, like this has the potential to become like a great practitioner. So if you compare to that, become great practitioner more precious than one body. Body comes and goes. You know? So in this reason, Buddha, uh, when he was a Bodhisattva, has sacrificed the body. So, so this uh, kind of uh, how he get courage to. Offer his body to this mother tiger is a training of many lives. Without training, just accidentally he got compassion and offered his body. Not that kind of thing. That's the reason. Right now, we have to train as much as we could. I usually suggest people how we do our our own kind of a point of view exchange meditation for a practical point of view. Yeah, not during the meditation time. I'm saying like a, uh, other. When we are traveling in a uh, uh, traffic uh, for public transport, transportation, or any other places, when you find some comfortable seat to sit on, and then someone who more much older than you, f- frail or unhealthy, they don't have found a seat standing. So immediately, without any hesitation, this is a great opportunity to me to exchange, give my comfort seat to this person. And I take this person's possession, discomfort to myself. This is a good exchanging. I always say, like, uh, normally we're hard to do it to offer your comfort to someone and take others' discomfort to yourself. But then I say, like, uh, uh, physical comfort and mental comfort. If you compare, mental comfort is more kind of a, a value. So it means like, uh, when you sincerely offer this physical comfort to someone. And take that person comfort to yourself physically, no comfort as uh, you sit in a comfortable chair, but mentally you far more comfort because you done something good. Yeah. So when you done something good, that pleasure is greater than just comfortable seat. So if you see that part, then exchange is not that hard. So if you expect something out of it. It may get disappointed. We say, for instance, you say, "I'm offering this in the comfortable, this uh, frail or unhealthy sick person." Then you expect this person going to say thank you to me. Then when you offer, whether he uh, deliberately not saying thank you or distracted, not saying anything, you get upset. Oh, I offer not said, but not saying to thank you to me. You know. So in the moment you expect it, you ruin your good effort. So that's the reason Buddhist like. Huh? You just accept the cause and effect. If people say an acknowledgement, it's good. If not, that's not the point. But you know why you did the right thing. That's is important. Yeah. So in this way, we can do so many kind of uh, exchanging. Uh, there are so many opportunities, small things. Like if you don't do small things, bigger things are never going to happen. You know. So every bigger, big experience, a realization comes from this accumulation of many small experiences. Yeah. So this uh, uh, third one.